Good morning. Thank you so much. So, uh, as as Luck mentioned, <clears throat> I'm married to Sarah. I don't have a lot of voice today, so we'll we'll see uh, how it goes if I get through this. Um, actually, my amazing, talented wife Sarah, she's speaking tomorrow evening, so I'm sort of kind of the warm up to that, um, which I don't mind. It's great. I'm used to that sort of being the sidekick. Uh, <clears throat> And I just want to say, first of all, I want to say, Saren, thank you so much for sharing about what you're doing. It's, isn't it just amazing? And I just, love, I just love especially the vision you have for church. You know, I think it's such a privilege. And um, some weeks ago, a friend of mine from our church, he had a couple of dreams. And without going into too much detail, the first dream, he was dreaming about uh, a well-known Danish evangelist, some of you would know him, but he had a dream about him, and there was also, I think the Pope was also in the dream, it doesn't really matter, it's not quite the, the point. And then the second dream he had, he was dreaming about being home in his hometown in Greenland, he's from Greenland, way up north, and he was dreaming about preaching and praying for people, and he recognized the faces of some of the people that he grew up with, and they were receiving Christ. And I thought it was such a beautiful vision for church as well. And you know what actually happened? Just a few weeks later, this Danish evangelist, he went to Greenland and he went to do a conference in his home city and there were hundreds, if not possibly thousands of Greenlandic people that were saved and healed during those times. And he would, he would look at the pictures on Facebook, our friend, he would see the faces of his friends and relatives that he knew from his hometown. Isn't that amazing? So... And again, it's all about having a vision for church. And I have to say that when we moved, Sarah and I moved with our great team, uh, among it was Mayana, are you here? Can we, just, can we just give her a little hand here? Mayana went with us to find the church. Um, we really only had basically a vision for church. That's what we had. We had a vision, an idea about people coming to know Jesus what it would look like to gather people into a community, uh, to see people get new friends, get to know God. And um, I will say, planting a church over the last six years, I've realized, well, I, I, I have to confess, I probably thought uh, it was gonna be hard, but I didn't realize quite how hard it is to build a church from scratch. And it really is, like we were singing, it really is about slow kingdom coming, building a church in the Nordic countries. But also, I wanna say that Kingdom is coming. Kingdom is coming. And we, uh, we're still a small church. We're not a, not a big church in any way. But lately we've seen some amazing things happen in our church. We have seen uh, more people come to our services than ever before. We've seen lots of guests, people bringing their friends. We've seen people get healed. We've seen people come to faith in Christ. Uh, we've seen uh, people that we haven't seen for years coming back. People we've been praying for for years start, start to come back to the church. And just in the last six months, I, I, th I can put name to at least nine people I know that have said yes to Jesus in our church and who most of them are coming to the church regularly. Uh, I think that deserves a clap, don't you think? Yeah. And um, I mean, it's just amazing. I can honestly tell you there's no church on earth I would rather be a part of than Uden Zwinyat at this time. Yeah. Yeah, that was a bit cheap, I know that, sorry. Okay, so one of the things we've been saying in our church lately, this was something that Sarah said in one of her, in one of her talks a few months ago. She said this, and we've been repeating that over and over. The kingdom of God feels like coming home. The kingdom of God feels like coming home. And we see that again and again. This is what people experience when they come into the fellowship. They experience coming home. So... This morning, let me read to you uh, about a, a short scripture from uh, Acts 6. This is about the very first church that we had in the world, about what that looked like. So let me read these seven verses for you. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. 
Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch. Again, if anyone is pregnant, there are some great suggestions there for you to go for. A convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So, here we are in the very first church uh, in chapter 6. Uh, quite some time has passed since chapter 5 where um, the apostles were in front of the Jewish council. They were being accused. And uh, now we have here a problem in the church. Right? There's a problem going on. And what is the problem? The problem is basically that more and more people are coming to faith. And the church is growing it's growing and it's becoming more diverse. You have different kinds of people. So this creates a problem. We can see in the chapter before, it says in Acts 5, 5, 14, nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. And just one, uh, just one sentence, why were people even coming to faith? People were coming to faith because the message of Jesus is one that transforms lives, right? When you encounter Jesus, whether it's in Myanmar, or in Odense, or it was 2,000 years ago in Israel, it just transforms lives. So people were coming to faith, and they joined the church. And uh, this created, obviously, problems. And I just wanted to remind you, at this time, this church was entirely made up of Jewish people. I mean, there were only Jews, people who had the Jewish faith, people who were also Jews, you know, uh, by their upbringing and their uh, way they looked and everything, but still, somehow, they found something to be conflicted about. The Hebraic Jews and the Greek Jews, they had something going on. And what we're seeing here is something that I learned when I was in Copenhagen Vineyard. Fleming would always tell me these uh, wise words. He would say, where two or three are gathered in my name, there's a conflict among you. <laughs> this is basically what we're experiencing here. So, and I think if you're a leader, this is something you recognize. You know, wherever there are pre people, there are problems and there are conflicts going on. So this is totally normal. I just want to tell you that. But actually, this story is a story about something as practical as delegation. It's a story about how the church was restructured because it was growing and they had growth pain. So uh, basically, it's, the text says this, the 12 apostles, they didn't want to use all their time on details about distributing food and solving conflicts. So they, had, they installed these seven people. Some <coughs> translations call them the seven deacons. And they knew they had to focus, I mean, the apostles knew they had to focus on what the text calls the prayer, the ministry of the word. Uh, that's what we would call, you know, Sunday services and leading. Um, so the result, we see the result in verse 7. What they do is they basically install new structures. They delegate responsibility. And the result we see in verse 7 the word of God spread, the number increased daily, so the, ch the church kept growing. And um, it's exactly the same thing we've been experiencing in our church. As more people have come, we have to make changes, we have to delegate, we have to do things a different way, and it can be quite painful, actually. But another thing that really strikes me about this text is it's so obvious that the apostles did not primarily have a calling to make like a large church for Christians to meet. Would you agree? You know, um, having a nice big congregation, a great mega church, that's not really a goal in itself. What, what happened in this chapter is the church is a result of the apostles' real calling, the true calling. They were set to focusing all their essential and all their resources on one primary thing, the thing. And that's what Jesus talks about in Matthew 28, when he says these famous verses, he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, 
and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. So this was the real calling, right? To make disciples or, in other words, make followers of Jesus or uh, help people to get into apprenticeship of Jesus, learning how to live the way that he lived, getting his life. So basically, what we're learning from this is the church is what comes out of making disciples. You know, we have a bunch of people who believe in Jesus. We better make a church, right? That's what church is. And then we create structures around that. And I think this is important to, this is like a main point that I'm going to get back to. But that doesn't mean that we as Christians should not have a vision for church. I think a vision for church is seriously important. You know, there was some years ago, uh, there was a strong stream of sort of deconstructing church, you know. We don't need church. We just have to be Christians on our own. You know, we'll just have communion around the dinner table. We'll just have a nice little church of five people in each church. And we'll just have a good time and live life. And, you know, we don't need all that church and structure and all that. It's, it's almost like evil. Can we just shut that all down? Because we need the church. And we need to have a vision for church, and we need to put structures around what God is doing. We need to have a place where people can go and meet Jesus and get to know him. That's what we need. Because the church is, just, is not just a human construct. It's not something that we humans have made up to kind of handle what God is doing. The church is a crucial part of what God is doing on this earth. It's his vehicle, it's the thing he is doing. The church is the thing God is doing. It's Jesus' very own idea. And as I think you know, if you've been around church, Jesus was a single man. And uh, the Bible uses this amazing picture of the church being his bride. So he was single, but the church is his bride. Let me read these verses from, from Revelation, where it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given for her to wear. And then it says, fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. And for me, this is just an amazing, this is just an amazing imagery. Can you imagine a more tender, loving, uh, compassionate, can you imagine a more beautiful picture to select to try and describe what church is than a bride getting ready? Is there something more sort of, you know, wow, it's just, this is, this is what church is when it does what it's supposed to do. That's what the Bible is trying to say. And I think so many people uh, inside the church, but also especially outside the church, they misunderstand what the church is. Am I right? People think maybe it's a religious institution, uh, maybe they think that the church is kind of like a service uh, that provides spiritual services to Christians. Have you ever thought of it that way? But really when the church does what it's supposed to do, which is to lead people to faith in Jesus and to learn how to follow him, then it does exactly what it's supposed to do. Then the church becomes an invitation to come home to God then the church becomes a place of home for me. This is what it is, welcome home. There's a very well-known church that has that as a slogan, welcome home. And this is exactly my story. When I walked into, I mean, I grew up in church and I have I've always uh, had a thing for church, couldn't really get it out of my life, I tried. Uh, but I had a lot of you know, bad experiences as well. And then in 2001, Sarah and I, we walked into the Vineyard Church in Copenhagen. We didn't know what to expect, but, but the one feeling I had when I came, it took me about five minutes to feel I've come home. This is home for me. And I know many of you have had the same feeling. And when that happens, the church becomes the most beautiful thing on this earth. It becomes the bride of Jesus. It is beautiful. It is admirable. It's exactly what we want. And I remember when we were starting the church in Odense, I would keep talking about it. Some people got a bit uncomfortable. But I would keep talking about, I want to make a big, fat bride for Jesus. 
That's what we want to do. This is what we're into, you know? You know, really, it's something to welcome him when he comes back. So, this story of the apostles and the first church, it really challenges us to think about church. You know, because it's so easy for us as Christians to think about the church as something that's there to fill my spiritual needs. You know, we think about the church is there to fill my spiritual needs. You know, if I don't really like it, if I think the worship is too boring or the preacher takes too long or I don't like the coffee, you know, I can give it like an angry smiley. I can go to the next church, right? See if they can fulfill my needs, you know. And really the thing is, a church should not be judged on whether it fills the needs of Christians, but on whether people are coming to faith. Thank you, Carsten. Let me say that again. A church should not be judged on whether it fills the needs of Christians, but on whether people come to faith. And Paul, he says this in 2 Corinthians when he writes to the church, he says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. It's our job to give that message to people. A church that does not lead people to faith in Jesus is not fulfilling the very purpose of being church. And that's why we have so many misunderstandings. You know, we don't see that. You, if you go to church, you don't see that. You think, is this, is this really a church? No, it is not. That's not the point. We lead people to faith by going out, meeting people, not sitting in the building, being you know, sitting behind the wall, being complacent, or we do it by inviting people, by being radically hospitable, radically inclusive, by giving people a home. This whole talk about being inclusive in church, some of you have heard this many times, that we should be inclusive and welcoming and, you know, meet people with a smile. It's not just something. It's not just to be nice. This is the very essence of being church, that people feel at home. This is what the church is. You know, Think about it this way, if God wants people to feel at home in his kingdom, but they don't feel at home in our church, is it really a church then? You know? If, we, if people are not coming to faith in our community, we are really stretching the concept of church. And I'm not saying this to criticize anyone, I'm not saying this to criticize, especially all of the leaders who are just trying and they're serving and they're, they just maybe don't feel that they see the results they're longing for. I'm saying this to those who think that church is about something else, because it is not. You know, I would think for you leaders, don't you, don't you feel like this? If people are not coming to faith at the moment, are you not on your knees, you know, just, Praying, uh, God, what do I do? I remember there, there's been some periods of time in our church plant where, you know, for, for, for months on end, we didn't see anyone come to faith, and I would be desperate. I'd be, God, what are we doing wrong? We need to do something else. You know, it's been three months, no one has said yes to Christ. It can't be right. So, maybe you have been having a time where you've been focusing more on your own needs, Maybe you've been complaining a bit, you know, those guys, they have more than me, you know, this church is all about the young people, or this church is all about the families, or, oh, this church is all about the new people, why do they get everything? And maybe you've forgotten that the focus is whether people are coming to faith in Jesus, since that's the primary thing the church is doing. Maybe you've forgotten that's what it's all about. We must be a church where people are coming to faith in Jesus. It's simply a matter of life and death, isn't it? It's life and death. That's the challenge we're facing as a church. It's our longing, it's our purpose, whether we're in Ulans or anywhere else, that's what we're all about. So, what I wanna tell you this morning is that no matter who you are, you can take part in this calling. You have a part to play. And I really want to invite you to go from this camp and start to inviting people 
to become disciples, inviting people to get to know Jesus. I thought it was amazing to hear Arnest Gargan share his stories. I mean, I love listening to Arnest. He makes it sound so easy to, to bring people to faith, right? It's like, oh, it's easy. I could, I could do that. But we know it's not easy. But I really want to encourage you to go and do this. Actually, the next verse in what I read before from 2 Corinthians, Paul says this. He says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God was, were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. In, in the Danish translation it says, God is begging people to get to know him through you. That's what it says. So what we are doing in our churches is not just fellowship for Christians. It's a matter of eternal importance. And we want to see people meet the resurrected Jesus, hear the gospel, hear about the one who has died on the cross for everyone's sake, the one who is our Lord, the one who we were just singing, there's no one else, there's no one else, he's the one. And there are so many ways you can take part in this, you know, and... Um, if, if, if anything, this is my main point. This is not up to just the pastors or the leaders. This is something we can all take part in. Um, you can all take part in going out to meet people, meet people at your workplace, your study, your family, go, go to the streets. We can all take part in inviting people into the community. Just say, come along and see what it's about. Come to the service, come to the small group and get them uh, and have people experience this feeling of coming home. And... Um, I want to give you a little fun, fun fact here about invitation. Uh, they did a, a big study in the UK and they, among Christians, and they came up with this result that between 80 and 90% of all Christians, they said that they had absolutely no intention of inviting anyone to their church. Let me say that again. Between 80 and 90% of Christians had absolutely no intention of ever inviting anyone to their church. And you think, well, couldn't possibly be like that here, could it? But I think I know one of the reasons why that is. I, I was listening to a speaker not so long ago who said this. He said, the greatest idol we have in the Western society is not money or it's not, you know, fame or success. Actually, the greatest idol that we have in our culture, the one that we all seem to, you know, uh, really be challenged by every day is the idol of comfort and convenience and safety. So many of us are so set in our daily lives. You know, we have our houses and cars and jobs and, and you know, we have all these things that we do and we're so comfortable. We're just not ready for this uh, talk about taking risks. We're not ready to go outside our comfort zones because we've worked our whole life to get this comfort. Am I touching something right here? You know, we are not ready to invite people to church because of the risk that it, of being rejected, the risk of maybe being ridiculed, you know, people will think bad about us. Um, or maybe we just simply don't believe that it even makes a difference for them to come. Maybe we're not ready to pray for people, you know, whether it's in the workplace or in the streets because it makes us un uncomfortable. Maybe we're not, at times, can't even be bothered to go to church because we would rather be in the comfort of our own homes. Maybe we say no to serving, no to giving generously, no to inviting, and no to showing radical hospitality. And I know we all have, you know, we have many excuses. We're busy. We have our family, we have our kids. We have money issues. We have personal problems. We have illnesses. We have so many things that we are fighting, each and every one of us, in our lives. But the fact is that whatever you are fighting with, I think too many Christians, we are more concerned about our daily lives and comfort and safety than we are with people getting to know Jesus Christ. And my prayer is, I don't think we will ever get to a point where all the difficulties go away. So we just feel like, yeah, I wanna do it. But my prayer is that our passion and our longing to see people get to know Jesus would become bigger than our need for comfort and security. That our passion, our longing, you know, our love for people that don't know Jesus yet, that are lost without him, that would just be bigger than anything in ourselves that are keeping us back. 
And you know, it might be that this statistic about 80 to 90 percent don't want to invite is, is accurate in, in some places. And, but I want to say this, in our church, we've decided we're totally going to smash that statistic. We're going to break it totally. And I want to invite you to do the same. Because being a church means to be a place where people come to faith in Jesus more than anything else. And then uh, let me just finish with this little thing here. There's one more thing I want to encourage you to do. And uh, because I know that um, most of us, we're not like, we're not like Arnes Gargan. And we find it really hard to, you know, reach over that gap to talk to people and invite them to get to know Jesus. We don't even know what to say. You know, we feel maybe shy or, and it's totally okay. We're, we're all very different as people. But I want to encourage you to do something that really makes a huge difference in our Western cultures. Something I really believe is like a hidden, you know, a jewel that we can use as Christians. And that is the amazing power of inviting people into your home. One thing that really marks our countries is this amazing uh, sense of loneliness that people have. So many people are desperate for community. So many people are hurting and they're in depression, they have problems. And inviting people into your home is, it's just really amazing. You know, I, um, uh, Sarah and I, we were in a conference in, in Ireland a couple of months ago, and we were staying at a house of a, of a great guy we know uh, called Mark. And he just, you know, when he came into his home, he said this, he said, I just want you to know that in this house is the Spirit of God, and we've had many pastors stay here, and everyone who stays here, they always leave here refreshed and filled with the Holy Spirit, just so you know. <laughs> and I tell you the truth, we had the best weekend we've had for years. I've ne I haven't been so refreshed for years. I think it was also the conference a little bit, but you know. <laughs> but really, we forget that the Spirit of God is in our homes. It's in our homes, it's in us, it's in our homes. If you don't have a home, if you're a student or whatever, if you don't have a home, just invite yourself to other people's homes. You know, get a free meal or invite people to go for coffee, whatever. You know, Jesus invited himself to go and visit people all the time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat with you tonight, he said, you know. <laughs> but really what God was asking me, you know, when I, when I listened to this guy, he said, Thomas, when is the la how many times have you had someone in your home who does not know me in the last couple of months? And I thought, ooh. You know, I've done all this important church stuff, but I really, it was really challenging to me. And I just realized we have to invite people into our home. Uh, and, uh, you know, for many people, the first step could be to come into your home and feel and, and just, just, you know, experience this Holy Spirit, experience the community, and maybe the church will be the next step for them. But I really want to challenge you right now, as you're, just, I'm just finishing up now. Write down a name in your notes or in your phone, write down a name of someone that you're thinking of right now that you should invite when you get back. I know you all have names in your heads right now. Write down someone and say, that person I'm gonna invite home when I get back. Because it might be the first step for them to get to know Christ. And then bring them all next year, will be twice as many, it will be great. So, the, so our home is a place where God is. It's a place where people can feel at home and the same goes for our church. You know, how often do we have people in our church that don't know him? You know, if it's not many, let's, let's get some more. Because this is where they will encounter this amazing feeling of coming home. That's really what opens most people to Christ, more than any words we say. So, that's what church is. When people encounter the hospitality, and the love of God, and they hear the gospel, and they respond, and we can just say to them, welcome home. Amen.